The following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, April 17th, 2024, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim discusses bonds year-to-date performance. Jim, the bond market is again tracking historic year-to-date losses. How is the position going into the year? Yeah, I think before we talk about, you know, those those losses, which we'll talk about in a second, we need to discuss where everybody was at the beginning of the year. So if we go to the first slide, Bank of America puts out a global fund manager survey. They usually survey about 250 to 300 global fund managers. Uh, very popular survey. It's as good as all the others. They've been asking a question for 20 years. Uh, what percentage of the managers, net percentage of the managers, think that we're going to have a lower rates? So all those that think they're going to have higher rates minus lower rates, 62% of them thought that rates would go lower in 2024 as of December of 23, so at the end of last year. That 62% was the highest it has been in the 20 years that they surveyed that. Now, that's important because that also includes the financial crisis of 2008. That includes the COVID shutdown of 2020, when interest rates plummeted and the economy was in trouble. And if you were long duration, if you were long bonds betting on falling rates, you you made tech stock-like returns, but they weren't as bullish then as they were in December of 23. Go to the next slide. Why were they so bullish? Well. The next slide shows us the soft landing scenarios or what they thought about the economy. So soft landing, 66% of them thought at the beginning of the year we would have what was called a soft landing. Now, I've been very critical of a soft landing because it's something that doesn't have a definition. It's, you know, is it kind of, you know, a mild recession? Is it negative GDP, positive, or is it something below potential? We don't know. It has no definition. And I used to quip that it's Wall Street's favorite you know, forecast because I'll tell you soft landing, it doesn't have a definition, but I'll give you one at the end of the year and I'll tell you why I was right. Hard landing is just another, you know, sticking with the airplane metaphor, that's a recession is what that is. So 23% of people thought that we would have a recession. No landing, sticking with the airplane metaphor again, is just that the economy continues to grow at its trend or potential, trend or potential. If the economy is not being stimulated or slowed down or manipulated in any way by either fiscal policy or monetary policy, it is believed that it would grow naturally on its own at two to two and a half percent. That would be what the no landing is. It just continues to grow at two to two and a half percent. But only six percent of people thought that. Now, what we're finding by middle of April is the soft landing was never a thing in the first place. Looks like the no landing is the scenario. The Atlanta Fed GDP now, which is a kind of a running tally of the data to date, how it's looking, is suggesting that the first quarter is going to be 2.9%. It's as good a guess as any guess. It'll be off, but all guesses are off. But it's still, it's above that 2 to 2.5% potential. And if we go to the final slide for at least this section, um, you know, they also asked this question uh, on the B of A Global Fund Manager Survey, what percentage of them think that short-term interest rates will be lower in a year, 89%. So 89% think that we were going to see cuts by the central bank, particularly the Fed. And 91% of them think that we were going to have lower inflation in the next year. Were we in April? It looks like the cuts that we're expecting, this is, we're speaking the day after Jay Powell was interviewed with the uh, Bank of Canada governor, and he pretty much said that he that the Fed is not seeing the confidence to lower rates, which is a fancy way of him saying higher for longer. And the and the markets, the Fed fund futures or the over or the Fed overnight index swap markets have priced less than a 50% chance, less than 50% that 
that the Fed would cut rates in May. Actually, it's about 3% for May. For June, it's around 20%. And for July, it's around 40%. So May, June, and July meetings have been priced out. The market is saying the next possibility of a rate cut is the September 18th meeting, of which I've argued the Fed's not going to move that close to the election. So now we're about to November. So all of a sudden, this 90% that think that we're going to see lower rates, well, we may not see them. Or maybe if we do, it's going to be at the very, very end of the year. And as far as inflation goes, it's higher now than it was at the beginning of the year. So where were we set up at the beginning of the year? Everybody was bullish. There was going to be a soft landing, which we haven't had. We've had no landing because inflation was going to keep falling, which it hasn't. And central banks were going to cut rates, which they have not. And when the case of the Fed may not happen till the very end of the year, even if that. Jim, how has the year turned out so far? <laughs> so if we look at the actual data and how the year's turned out so far, we go to the next chart. Messy chart one is the Bloomberg US Aggregate Index. For those of you that are old enough, this used to be Barclays, this used to be Lehman. It goes back to 1976. This shows you January 1st to December 31st, all those gray squiggly lines are individual years. There's 49 of them on the chart. The green line is the best year ever. That was 1982 when the bond market returned 32%. And the red line is the worst year ever. That was 2022, two years ago, when it was down 13%. The blue line is what we've tracked this year through Monday's close. Uh, we were down 3.11%. We're roughly down about the same amount two days later when we're recording. And that tracks the third worst year ever through April 15th. Only 1980, 1994, and 2022 have been worse out of the 49 years through this point in the year. That's not good because anybody who's steeped in bond market lore knows 1980, 1994, and 2022 were disastrously bad years for the bond market. And it's not good that you're tracking something like that. So it's not been good for these managers that have had the 20 year long in interest rates that we've seen. If we go to the next chart, um, okay, they're global fund managers, but that was domestic US returns. What about global returns? So here's the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Index. This index was started in 1990. Uh, by the way, when it looks stair-steppy like 1995 was up 19%, which was the best year ever, that's because they used to calculate the index monthly. Um, and when it looks a little bit more high frequencies when they calculate it daily. So it is down 4.25% through April 15th. That is the second worst year since 1990. Only 2022 was worse at this point. So all of the managers that were positioned long in bonds because they thought that we were going to have a no landing, falling interest rates, and cutting and, and central banks cutting rates, it's been disastrous for them. Because not only were they positioned incorrectly, they were positioned incorrectly in a bad market on top of it because we've seen interest rates skyrocket. The 10-year yield in the United States started the year at 388. The day before we were recording, we hit 469. So basically, uh, we were up 81 basis points for the year. 50 of those 81 basis points has come in the last three weeks. So April, the month of April has been horrifically bad. The most of the total return of that 4.25% loss that you see in the global aggregate index, something like 2.7% of the 4.25 has come in the last three weeks. 2% of the 3.11% losses have come in the last three weeks on the domestic aggregate index. So interest rates have been going up. It's been a terrible market. And on top of that, it's been a terrible market to actually be long the market because not only are you suffering through your index having one of the worst years ever, you're probably doing worse than your index right now. When do rates peak? That's a good question, when rates peak. And I would argue they're going to peak when this narrative is gone that people are embarrassed to say the words soft landing, we're on the last mile to 2%, the Fed's gonna cut rates three times or something along those lines. Now, we're recording on Wednesday, the 17th of April, 
I can tell you I've seen half a dozen times on Bloomberg and CNBC, people use exactly, that manage trillions of dollars of assets, um, that, you know, because they work for big, giant global investment banks, use the terms soft landing for 2024. We're in the last mile to 2%. Still think the Fed's going to cut three times. These have been the narratives that have not been working. When these narratives are done and they stop, you know, and, and when these narratives become embarrassing to say is when they've given up on these narratives and they've positioned away from them. The cynic in me would like to explain it this way. What you're doing is you're continuing to read to me your January, your 2024 outlook that you wrote in January. Everybody knows that by March you should be you should stop talking about it because they almost never work. Because everybody's January 2024 outlook that came out in um, or the 2024 outlook that came out in January said we're going to have a soft landing and the Fed's going to cut rates and inflation's going to come down, and that's clearly not been the case. And even yesterday, Jay Powell said I don't have the confidence to cut rates. So. What we should see is people running away from that narrative, meaning that they're positioning for higher rates, higher for longer. And once we get that positioning done, the, whether that takes a couple of more days or a few more months, that's what we'll be monitoring. I don't think we're there yet. Then we could say that maybe we've hit an interim top. Now, the last chart I'll throw out there is kind of a tangential topic, but it's also kind of important. People have been saying all year, the stock market doesn't care about interest rates. And I've always pushed back and said, it should always care about interest rates. It could be a case that they're at a position, they're at a rate now that doesn't bother them. But I jokingly like to say, there's two types of people that say the stock market doesn't care about interest rates. Those that have lost money and those that will lose money if you take that position. Well, when do interest rates start to matter for the stock market? And I've argued. It was 450, which was last week. So when we cross through 450, this is a chart of the S&P. I drew a red line on the chart. We're back to mid-February levels on the stock market. Uh, how did we get back here? Because interest rates matter. And we finally found, maybe we found that magic rate that starts to, and I want to use this word carefully, bother the bond to stock market. Not crash it, not cause a bear market, but bother 450. We're at 460 right now as we as we record. We go to 470, we go to 480, we go to 490. I think it gets bothered a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. Remind everybody, in from July to October of last year, the S&P corrected 10%. It fell 10%. What also happened from July to October while it was correcting 10%? The 10-year yield went from 360 to 503, went up 140 basis points. Well, we're kind of seeing the same thing now. You know, if we were to get to over 5% of the 10 year yield, I could see something similar to that. So yes, interest rates matter. And they, you know, they, they you could argue they matter, they always matter, but we're at a level where we, we don't need, they're not an issue, but if they go up or down, they become an issue. Well, they've gone up enough now that I think they're an issue. And the longer that people continue to believe that there's going to be a soft landing and they're positioned long and losing money or underperforming, to be more specific, and still believe the Fed's going to cut rates a lot, and still believe inflation's going to fall, I don't think we've hit the peak in yields. It's only one that narrative gets repudiated and all of the selling that would come from repudiating it is behind us, then we can see a peak in yields. I don't think we're there yet. But if I was to put it in a baseball metaphor, because we're in baseball season, it's probably around the seventh inning of this rise in rates. And if anybody knows baseball, a lot can happen in the last three innings. Um, you know, so we'll have to see. So we're, you know, the majority of the game is done. But look, there could still, if you saw the Cubs game last night, there could still be 10 more runs <laughs> after the seventh inning. Uh, and so we'll see what where what comes, what comes. But we're still long in the tooth but we're not quite there yet. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianco Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks again and have a great day.